Hello and welcome to the Data Engineering Podcast, the show about modern data management. When you're ready to build your next pipeline or want to test out the projects you hear about on the show, you'll need somewhere to deploy it, so check out our friends over at Linode. With 200 gigabit private networking, scalable shared block storage, and a 40 gigabit public network, you've got everything you need to run a fast, reliable, and bulletproof data platform. If you need global distribution, they've got that covered too with worldwide data centers, including new ones in Toronto and Mumbai. And for your machine learning workloads, they just announced dedicated CPU instances. Go to dataengineeringpodcast.com slash Linode, that's L-I-N-O-D-E today, to get a $20 credit and launch a new server in under a minute. And don't forget to thank them for their continued support of this show. And you listen to this show to learn and stay up to date with what's happening in databases, streaming platforms, big data, and everything else you need to know about modern data management. For even more opportunities to meet, listen, and learn from your peers, you don't want to miss out on this year's conference season. We have partnered with organizations such as O'Reilly Media, Dataversity, Carinium Global Intelligence, and Data Council. Upcoming events include the O'Reilly AI Conference, the Strata Data Conference, the Combined Events of the Data Architecture Summit and Graph Forum, and Data Council in Barcelona. Go to dataengineeringpodcast.com slash conferences to learn more about these and other events and take advantage of our partner discounts to save money when you register today. Your host is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Ben Johnson and Luke Steenson about Vector, a high-performance, open-source, observability data router. So, Ben, can you start by introducing yourself? Sure. My name is Ben. I am the co-founder CTO at Timber.io. And Luke, how about yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm Luke Steenson. I'm an engineer at Timber. And Ben, going back to you, do you remember how you first got involved in the area of data management? Yeah, so I mean, just being an engineer, obviously, you get involved in it through observing your systems. And so before we started Timber, I was an engineer at SeatGeek. We dealt with all kinds of observability challenges there. And Luke, do you remember how you first got involved in the area of data management? Uh, yeah, so at my last job, I ended up working with Kafka um, quite a bit in a in a few different context. Um, so I ended up getting getting pretty involved with that project, uh, leading some of our internal stream processing projects that we were trying to get off the ground. And I just found it, you know, it, it's a very interesting space. And the more that you dig into a lot of different engineering problems, it, it does, it ends up boiling down to, to managing your data, especially when you have a lot of it, it kind of becomes the, the primary challenge um, and limits a lot of what you're able to do. So kind of the more tools and techniques you you have to address those issues and, and use as kind of design tools, the, the further you can get, I think. And so you both work at Timber.io and you have begun work on this vector project. So I'm wondering if you can explain a bit about what it is and the overall reason that you had for creating it in the first place. Yeah, sure. So on this, on the most basic sense, Vector is an observability data router, and it collects data from anywhere in your infrastructure, whether that be a log file over a TCP socket, it could be StatsD metrics, uh, and then Vector is designed to ingest that data and then send it to multiple storages. And so the idea is that it is sort of vendor agnostic and collects data from many sources and sends it to many sinks. And the reason we created it was really for a number of reasons. I would say, um, one, you know, being an observability company, uh, and then when we initially launched Timber, uh, it was a hosted logging platform and we needed a way to collect our customers' data. We tried writing our own uh, initially in Go that was very just kind of specific to our platform. Uh, that was that was very difficult. Um, we started using uh, off-the-shelf solutions and found those also to be difficult. We were getting a lot of support requests. It was hard for us to contribute and debug them. And then I think in general, you know, our, our ethos as a company is we want to create a world where developers have choice and aren't locked into specific technologies, are able to move with the times, choose best-in-class tools for the job, and that's kind of what prompted us to start Vectors. That vision, I think, is enabled by an open collector that is vendor agnostic and meets a quality standard uh, that uh, makes people want to use it. And so uh, it looks like we have other areas in this uh, podcast where we'll get into some of the details there. 
but we really wanted to raise the bar on the open collectors and start to give control and ownership back to the people, the developers that were deploying Vector. And as you mentioned, there are a number of other off-the-shelf solutions that are available. Personally, I've had a lot of experience with FluentD, and I know that there are other systems coming from the Elastic Stack and other areas. I'm curious, what are some of the tools that you consider to be comparable or operating in the same space and any of the ones that you've had experience with that you found to be lacking and what were the particular areas that you felt needed to be addressed that weren't being handled by those other solutions? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. So first I would probably classify the collectors as either open or not. And so typically I wouldn't, we're not too concerned with vendor specific collectors like the Splunk forwarder or any other sort of you know uh, thing that just ships data to one service. So I'd say that, you know, in the category of just comparing tools, I'll focus on the ones that are open, like you said, FluentD, FileBeat, Logstash, like I think it's questionable that they're completely open, but I think we're more comparable to those tools. And then I'd also say that like we're, we typically try to stay away from, like, I don't want to say anything negative about the projects because I, I, a lot of them were uh, pieces of inspiration for us. And so, you know, we respect the fact that they are open and they were solving a problem at the time. But I'd say one of the projects that that really uh, we thought was a great alternative and inspired us is one called Cernan. It was built by Postmates. It's also written in Rust. And that kind of opened our eyes a little bit, like a new bar, a new standard that you could set with these, these collectors. And... Um, we actually know Brian Troutwine. He was one of the developers that worked on it. Um, he's been really friendly and helpful to us. But the sort of thing that the reason we didn't use Cernan is like one, it's it was created out of necessity at Postmates and it doesn't seem to be actively maintained. And so that's it's one of the big reasons we started Vector. And so I would say that's that's something that's lacking is like, you know, a project that uh, is actively maintained and, and is in it for the long term. Uh, obviously that's that's important and then in terms of like actual specifics of these projects uh, there's a lot that I could say here but you know on one hand we've seen a trend of certain tools that are built for a very specific storage and then sort of like backed into supporting more syncs and it seems like the like incentives and sort of fundamental uh, practices of those tools are not aligned with many disparate storages that kind of ingest data differently for example like the fundamentals of like batching and stream processing. I think thinking about those two ways of like collecting data and sending it downstream kind of don't work for every single storage that you want to support. The other thing is just the obvious ones like performance, reliability, having no dependencies. You know, if you're not a strong Java shop, you probably aren't comfortable deploying something like Logstash and then managing the JVM and everything associated with that. And uh, yeah. I think, uh, and then, and then the other thing is, we wanted a, a collector that was like fully vendor agnostic and vendor neutral, and uh, a lot of them don't necessarily fall into that bucket. And as I said before, like that's something we really strongly believe in is an observability world where developers can rely on a best in class tool that is not biased and has aligned incentives with the people using it, because there's just so many benefits that stem off of that. And. On the point of sustainability and openness, I'm curious, since you are part of a company and this is in some ways related to the product offering that you have, how you're approaching issues such as project governance and sustainability and ensuring that the overall direction of the project is remaining impartial and open and trying to foster a community around it so that it's not entirely reliant on the direction that you try to take it internally and that you're incorporating input from other people who are trying to use it for their specific use cases? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, so one is we want to be totally transparent on everything, like everything we do with Vector, discussions, specifications, roadmap planning, it's all available on GitHub. And uh, so nothing is private there. And we want Vector to truly be an open project that anyone can contribute to. And then in terms of like governance and sustainability, like we try to do a really good job um, just maintaining the project. So number one is like good issue management, like making sure that that's, that's done properly. Um, 
helps people like search for issues, helps them understand like which issues need help, like what are good first issues to start contributing on. Uh, we wrote an entire contribution guide and actually spent good time and put some serious thought into that so that people understand like what are the principles of Vector and like how do you get started. And then I think the other thing that really sets Vector apart is like the documentation. And I think that's actually very important for sustainability and uh, helping to it's, it's really kind of like a reflection of your project's respect for the users in a way, uh, but it also serves as a really good opportunity to like explain the project and help people understand like the internals of the project and how to, how to contribute to it. So it really kind of all comes together, but I'd say, yeah, the number one thing is just transparency and making sure everything we do is out in the open. And then in terms of the use cases that Vector enables, obviously one of them is just being able to process logs from a source to a destination. But in the broader sense, what are some of the ways that Vector is being used both at Timber and with other users and organizations that have started experimenting with it beyond just the simple case? So first, like Vector's new, so we're still learning a lot as we go. But, you know, the, the core use cases, the business use cases we see, is there's everything from reducing cost. Vector is quite a bit more efficient than most collectors out there. So just by deploying Vector, you're going to be using less CPU cycles, less memory, and you'll have more of that available for the app that's running on that server. Outside of that, it's like the fact that Vector enables uh, choosing multiple storages and, and the storage that is best for your use case lets you reduce cost as well. So for example, you know, like if you're running an elk stack, you don't necessarily want to use your elk stack for archiving. You can use another cheaper, durable storage for that purpose and sort of take the responsibility out of your elk stack and that reduces costs in that way. So I think that's like an interesting way to use vector. Uh, another one is, like I said before, reducing lock-in. That use case is, is so powerful because it gives you agility, choice, control, um, ownership of your data. Uh, transitioning vendors is a big use case we've seen. Uh, so many companies we talk to are bogged down and locked in to vendors and they're tired of paying the bill, but they don't see a clean way out. And like observability is an, is an interesting problem because it's not just technology coupling, like there are human workflows that are coupled with the systems you're using. And so transitioning out of something that maybe isn't working for your organization anymore uh, requires a bridge. And so Vector is a really great way to do that. It's like deploy Vector, continue sending it to whatever vendor you're using. And then you can, at the same time, start to try out other storages and like other setups without disrupting like the human workflows in your organization. And I, I could keep going. There's data governance. Uh, we've seen people, you know, cleaning up their data, enforcing schemas, um, security and compliance. You have the ability to like scrub sensitive data at the source before it even goes downstream. And so, you know, again, like having a good open tool like this is so incredibly powerful because of all of those use cases that it enables and like lets you take advantage of those when you're ready. In terms of the actual implementation of the project, you've already mentioned in passing that it was written in Rust. And I'm wondering if you can dig into the overall system architecture and implementation of the project and some of the ways that it has evolved since you first began working on it. Like you said, Rust is... I mean, that's kind of the first thing everybody looks at. It's written in Rust. Um, and kind of on top of that, we're we're building with the like the Tokyo asynchronous IO uh, kind of stack of, of libraries and tools within the Rust ecosystem. Um, kind of from the beginning, we we've started Vector pretty simple architecturally. Um, and we're kind of, we have an eye on where, on where we'd like to be, but we're, we're trying to get there very, very incrementally. Um, so at a high level, each of the internal components of Vector is, is generally either a source, a transform, or a sync. Um, so so probably familiar terms if you've, if you've dealt with this type of tool before, but sources are something that helps you ingest data, transforms, um, different things you can do, like parsing JSON data into you know our, our internal data format, uh, doing regular expression value extracting, uh, like Ben mentioned, and enforcing schemas, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and then syncs, obviously, which is where we 
will actually forward that data downstream to some external storage system or service or, or something like that. Um, so that those are kind of the high level pieces. Uh, we have some different patterns um, around each of those. And obviously there's different different flavors. Um, you know, if you if you have a UDP syslog source that's that's gonna look and uh, operate a lot differently than a file tailing source. Um, so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of different styles of implementation, but they all we, we kind of fit them into those three buckets um, of source transform and sync. And then the way that you configure vector, you're you're basically building a data flow graph where where data comes in through a source, flows through any number of transforms, and then down uh, the graph into a sync or multiple syncs. Um, we try to keep it uh, as flexible as possible. Um, so you can you can pretty much build like an arbitrary graph um, of, of data flow. Obviously, there are going to be situations where that that isn't, you know, you, you could build something that's, that's pathological or won't perform well, but we, we kind of leaned towards giving users the flexibility to do what you want. So if you want to, you know, parse something as JSON and then use a regex to extract something out of one of those fields um, and then enforce a schema and drop some fields, you can kind of chain all these things together and you can you can kind of have them fan out into different transforms and merge back together into a single sync or feed two syncs from the same transform output, um, all that kind of stuff. So basically we, we try to keep it very flexible. We definitely don't advertise ourselves as like a general purpose stream processor, but there's a lot of influence um, from working with those kinds of systems um, that has found its way into the design of Vector. Yeah, the ability to map together different components of the overall flow is definitely useful. And I've been using FluentD for a while, which has some measure of that capability, but it's also somewhat constrained in that the logic of the actual pipeline flow is dependent on the order of specification in the configuration document, which is sometimes a bit difficult to understand exactly how to structure the document to make sure that everything is functioning as properly. And there are some mechanisms for being able to route things slightly out of band with particular syntax, but just managing it has gotten to be somewhat complex. So when I was looking through the documentation for Vector, I appreciated the option of being able to simply say that the input to one of the steps is uh, linked to the ID of one of the previous steps so that you're not necessarily constrained by order of definition and that you can instead just use the ID references to ensure that the flows are yeah, being constructed appropriately. Yeah, that was definitely something that we spent a lot of time thinking about and we still spend a lot of time thinking about. Because, um, you know, if you kind of squint at these config files, they're they're kind of like a program that you're writing. Um, you know, you have data inputs and processing steps and, and data outputs. So you you want to make sure that that flow is clear to people. Um, and you also want to make sure that, you know, that there aren't going to be any surprises. Uh, you don't want, I know a lot of tools, like you mentioned, to have this as kind of an implicit part of the way the config is written, um, which can be difficult to manage. We wanted to make it as explicit as possible, um, but also in a way that is still relatively readable um, from a, you know, just when you open up the config file. Um, we, we've gone with a pretty simple TOML format. And then like you mentioned, you just kind of mentioned, you just kind of specify which input each component should draw from. Um, we have had some kind of ideas and discussions about what uh, our own configuration file format would look like. I mean, we've what we would love to do eventually is make these kind of pipelines as much as as pleasant to write as something like like a bash pipeline, um, which we think that's another really powerful inspiration for us. Obviously, they have their limitations, um, but the things that you can do just in a bash pipeline with a, um, you know, you have a log file, you grep things out, you run it through awk. There's all kinds of really cool stuff that you can do in, in like a lightweight way. Um, and that's something that we've, 
we've put a little thought into how can we be as close to that level of like power and flexibility um, while avoiding a lot of the limitations of, you know, obviously being a single tool on a single machine. And, you know, I don't want to get into all the the gotchas that come along with writing bash one-liners. Um, obviously there are, there are a lot, but it, it, we want, it's something that we want to kind of take as much of the good parts from as possible. And then in terms of your decision process for the actual runtime implementation for both the actual engine itself, as well as the scripting layer that you implemented in Lua, what was the decision process that went into that as far as choosing and settling on Rust? And uh, what were the overall considerations and requirements that you had as part of that decision process? So from a high level, the things that we thought were most important um, when writing this tool, which which is obviously going to run on other people's machines and hopefully run on a lot of other people's machines. Um, we want to be, you know, respectful of the fact that they're, you know, willing to put our tool uh, on, on a lot of their, their boxes. So we don't want to use a lot of memory. We don't want to lo- use a lot of CPU. We want to be as resource constrained as possible. Um, so, so efficiency is a big, um, or was a big, point for us um which rust obviously gives you the ability to do there's you know i i'm a big fan of rust so i could probably talk for a long time about all the all the wonderful features and things but honestly um the fact that it's a it's a tool that lets you write you know very efficient programs um control your memory use pretty tightly uh, that's somewhere that we i think have a pretty big advantage over a lot of other tools and then just I, i was the first engineer on the project and i know rust quite well so just kind of the, the the human aspect of it, it it made sense for us. We're lucky to have a, a couple people at Timber who are who are very very good with Rust, very familiar and involved in the community. Um, so it has worked out. I think I'd say it's worked out very well. From the embedded scripting perspective, uh, Lua was kind of an obvious obvious first choice for us. Um, there's very good precedent for for using Lua in this manner. Um, for example, in Nginx and uh, HA Proxy, they both have uh, Lua environments that let you do a lot of amazing things that you would maybe never expect to be able to do with those tools. You can write a little bit of Lua, and there you go. You're all set. Um, so Lua is very much built for this purpose. It's, it's kind of built as an embedded language. And there were, was a mature implementation uh, of bindings for us so it didn't take a lot of work um, to integrate Lua and we have a lot of confidence that it's uh, a reasonably performant reliable thing that we can kind of drop in and expect to work that being said it's it's definitely not the end-all be-all um, we know that while people can be familiar with Lua from a lot of different areas where it's used like gaming and or game development and uh, like I mentioned, some observability tools or infrastructure tools. We are interested in supporting more than just Lua. Uh, we actually have a work in progress uh, JavaScript transform that will allow people to kind of use that as an alternative engine uh, for transformations. Um, and then a little bit longer term, we we this is we kind of want this area to mature a little bit before we dive in, but the the WASM space has been super interesting. And I think that particularly from a flexibility and performance perspective could give us a platform to do some really interesting things in the future. Yeah, I definitely think that the WebAssembly area is an interesting space to keep an eye on because of the fact that it is in some ways being targeted as sort of a universal runtime that multiple different languages can target. And then in terms of your choice of Rust, another benefit that it has when you're discussing the uh, memory efficiency is the guaranteed memory safety, which is certainly important when you're running it in customer environments, because that way you're less likely to have memory leaks or accidentally crash their servers because of a bug in your implementation. So I definitely think that that's a, a good choice as well. And then one other aspect of the choice of Rust for the implementation language that I'm curious about is how that has impacted the overall uptake of users who are looking to contribute to the project, either because they're interested in learning Rust, but also in terms of people who aren't necessarily familiar with Rust and any barriers that that may pose. 
It's something that's kind of hard. It, it's hard to know because obviously we can't we didn't can't inspect the alternate timeline where we we wrote it in Go or something like that. I would say that there's kind of there's there's ups and downs from a lot of different perspectives. From like a from a developer interest perspective, uh, I think Rust is is something that a lot of people find interesting now. The 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 sales pitch is a good one, and, it, and a lot of people find it compelling. Um, so I think it's definitely, you know, it's, it's caught a few more people's interest because it happens to be written in Rust. Um, we, we try not to push on that too hard because of course there's, there's the other set of people who, who do not like Rust and are very tired of hearing about it. So, um, you know, we, we love it and we're very happy with it, but we try not to make it, um, you know, a, a primary marketing point or anything like that. Um, but I, I, I think it, it does it does help uh, to some degree. And then from a contributions perspective, again, it's hard to say for sure. But I do know from experience that we have had, you know, a handful of people kind of pop up from the open source community and, and give us some some really high quality contributions. And we've been really happy with that. Like I said, we, we can't really know how that would compare to uh, if we had written it in a language that more people are proficient in, but the contributions from the community that we have seen so far um, have been, like I said, really high quality and, and we're really happy with it. The, the JavaScript transform that I mentioned is, is actually something that's a good example of that. We had a contributor come in and, and do a ton of really great work to, to make that a reality. And it, it's something that we're pretty close to being able to merge and, and ship. So that's something that I, I definitely shared a little bit of that concern. I was like, I know Rust at least has the reputation of being a more difficult to learn language, but the the community is there. There's a lot of really skilled developers that are interested in Rust and you know would love to have an open source project like Vector that they can contribute to. Um, and and we've seen we've definitely seen a lot of benefit from that. In terms of the internals of Vector, I'm curious how the data itself is represented once it is ingested in the sink and how you process it through the transforms as far as if there's a particular data format that you use internally in memory and also any capability for schema enforcement as it's being flowed through Vector out to the sinks. Um, yeah, so right now we have our own internal our own in-memory data format. It's it's kind of, it's a little bit, I don't want to say thrown together, but it's something that's been <laughs> incrementally evolving um, pretty rapidly as we build up the number of, of different sources and syncs that we support. This was actually something that we deliberately kind of set out to do when we were building vectors. We didn't want to start with the data model. You know, there are some projects that do that. And that's, I think, there's definitely a space for that. The, the data modeling in the observability space is uh, is not always the best, um, but we explicitly kind of wanted to leave that to other people, and we were going to start with the simplest possible thing, and then kind of add features up as we found that we we needed them in order to better support uh, the data models of the the downstream sinks and the transforms that we wanted to be able to do. So from from day one, the the data model was basically just string you know you send us a log message and we represent it as a as a string of characters obviously it's grown a lot since then but we we basically now support we call them events internally it's kind of our our vague name for everything that flows through the system uh, events can be a log or they can be a metric if they're a metric we, we support a number of different types including counters gauges um, kind of all your standard types of metrics from like the, the stats d family of tools and then logs uh, they can be just a message, um, like I said, just a string. We still support that as much as we ever have. Um, but we also support more structured data. Um, so right now, it's a flat map of string, you know, a map of string to something. We have a variety of different types that the values can be. Um, and that's also something that's kind of growing as we want to better support different tools. So right now, it's kind of like non-nested JSON-ish representation. Um, in memory, we don't actually serialize it to, to JSON. We support a few extra types like timestamps and, and things like that that are important for our use case. But in general, that's that's kind of how you can think about it. We have, uh, we have a protocol buffers schema for that data format that we use when we serialize to disk, uh, when we do some of our on-disk buffering. But that 
is I wouldn't say that's necessarily the primary representation. We, when you work with it in a in a transform, you're you're looking at that that in memory representation that, like I said, kind of looks a lot like JSON, um, and that's something that we're we're kind of constantly reevaluating and thinking about how we want to evolve. Um, I think kind of the next the next step in that evolution is to make it not necessarily just a flattened map and move it towards uh, supporting like nested maps, nested keys. Uh, so it, it's going to move more towards like an actual, uh, you know, full JSON with better types and support for things like that. And on the reliability front, you mentioned briefly the idea of disk buffering, and that's definitely something that is necessary for the case where you need to restart the service and you don't want to lose messages that have been sent to an aggregator node, for instance. I'm curious, what are some of the overall capabilities in Vector that uh, support this reliability objective and also in terms of things such as malformed messages, if you're trying to enforce a schema, if there's any way of putting those into a dead letter queue for reprocessing or anything along those lines. Um, yeah, dead letter queue specifically isn't something that we support at the moment. Um, that's It is something that we've been thinking about, um, and, and we do want to come up with a, a good way to support that. But currently, that isn't something that we have. A lot of transforms like the, the schema enforcement transform uh, will end up just just dropping the events that don't, or it will if it can't enforce that they do meet the schema by dropping fields, for example. It will it will just drop the event, which you know we're we recognize the the shortcomings there. Um, I think one of the one of the things that is a little bit nice from an implementer's perspective about working in the observability space as opposed to uh, you know the the normal data streaming world with application data. Uh, is that people can be a little bit more, there's more of an, an expectation of best effort, um, which is something that we're willing to take advantage of a little bit in like the very beginning, early stages of a certain feature or tool. Um, but, it, but it's definitely a part of the, a part of the ecosystem that we want to, to push forward. So it's, that's something that we, we try to keep in mind as we build all this stuff is, Yes, it might be okay now. We may have parity with other tools, for example, if we just drop messages that don't meet a certain schema. But you know, how can we how can we do better than that? Other tools that or other kind of things in the toolbox that you can reach for for this type of thing are I mean the most basic one would be that you can send data to multiple syncs. Uh, so if you have a, a kind of classic syslog like setup where you're you're forwarding logs around. It's, it's super, super simple to just add a secondary that will forward to both syslog aggregator A and syslog aggregator B. That's 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 nothing particularly groundbreaking, but it's something that is kind of the start. Beyond that, I mentioned the the disk buffer, where we want to make do it as good a job as we can, ensuring that we don't lose your data uh, once you have sent it to us. Uh, we are we are still a a single node tool at this point. We're, we're not a distributed storage system, so there are going to be some inherent limitations in, in the guarantees that we can provide you there. We do recommend, you know, if you, if you really want to make sure that you're not losing any data at all, uh, Vector is going to, it's not going to be able to give you the guarantees that something like Kafka would. So we, we want to make sure that we work well with tools like Kafka um, that are going to give you pretty solid you know, redundant, reliable, distributed storage guarantees. Um, let's see. Other than those two, we writing the tool in Rust is you know kind of an indirect way that we want to try to make it just as reliable as possible. I think Rust has a little bit of a reputation for making it tricky to do things. You know that the compiler is very picky and wants to make sure that everything you're doing is safe, um, and that's something that you can you definitely take advantage of to kind of guide you in in writing you mentioned like memory safe code but it it, it ex, ex kind of expands beyond that into ensuring that every error that pops up you're going to you're handling explicitly um, at that le level or a level above um, and things like that it kind of guides you into writing more reliable code by default obviously it's still on you to make sure that you're covering all the cases and and things like that but it, it definitely helps um, and then moving forward, we're 
we're going to spend a lot of time in, in the very near future setting up certain kind of internal torture environments, if you will, um, where we can run Vector for long periods of time and kind of induce certain failures in the network and, you know, the upstream services, maybe delete some data from underneath it on disk and that kind of thing. Um, kind of fami- if you're familiar with the, the Jepson suite of database testing tools, obviously we don't have quite the same types of invariants that a, an actual database would have. Uh, but I think we, we can use a lot of those techniques to kind of stress tr- vector and see how it responds. And like I said, we're going to be limited in, in what we can do based off of the fact that we're a single node system. And, you know, if you're sending us data over UDP, there's not a ton of guarantees that we're going to be able to give you. But to the degree that we're able to give guarantees, we very much would like to do that. So that's that's definitely it's a focus of ours. And we're going to be exploring that as much as possible. And then in terms of the deployment topologies that are available, you mentioned one situation where you're forwarding to a Kafka topic, uh, but I'm curious what other options there are for ensuring high availability and just the overall uptime of the system for being able to deliver messages or events or data from the source to the various destinations. Uh, Yeah, there are a few different kind of general topology patterns that we you know we, we've documented and and we we recommend to people um, I mean the simplest one depending on how your infrastructure is set up can just be to run vector on each of your you know application servers or, or whatever it is that you have um, and kind of run them there in a very distributed manner and and forward to you know if you are sending it to a certain upstream, logging service or, or something like that, you can kind of do that where it's you don't necessarily have any aggregation happening in your infrastructure. Um, that's pretty easy to get started with, but it, it does have limitations. Um, if, you know, if you don't want to allow outbound internet access, for example, from, um, from each of your nodes. The next kind of step, like you mentioned, is you know, we would support a second kind of tier of, of vector uh, running maybe on a dedicated box, and, and you would have a number of nodes forward to this more centralized aggregator node, and then that node would forward to whatever other you know syncs that you have in mind. That's kind of the second level of complexity, I would say. Um, you, you do get some benefits in that you have some more power to do things like aggregations and sampling in a centralized manner. Um, there's going to be certain things that you, you can't necessarily do if you never bring the data together. Um, and you can do that, especially if you're looking to reduce cost. It's nice to be able to have that that aggregator node kind of have as, a, as a leverage point where you can bring everything together, evaluate what is you know most important for you to forward to different places um, and, and do that there. Um, and then kind of the, for people who want more reliability than a you know a single aggregation node at this point our recommendation is something like kafka um, that that's going to give you distributed durable storage we that that is a big jump in in terms of infrastructure complexity Um, so there's definitely room for some in-betweens there that we're working on in terms of you know having a failover option Uh, like right now you could put a couple aggregator nodes behind a TCP load balancer or something like that, that's not necessarily going to be the best experience. So we're kind of investigating our options there to try to give people a good range of choices for you know how much they're willing to invest in the infrastructure and what kind of reliability and, and robustness benefits that they that they need. Another aspect of the operational characteristics of the system are being able to have visibility into, particularly at the aggregator level, what the current status is of the buffering or any errors that are cropping up and just the overall system capacity. And I'm curious if there's any current capability for that or what the future plans are along those lines. Um, Yeah, we have some, we have a setup for, for kind of our own internal metrics at this point that that is another thing that we're 
kind of alongside uh, the reliability s- stuff that you mentioned that, that we're really looking at very closely right now and, and what, what we want to do next. Uh, we, we've kind of, the way we've set ourselves up, we have um, kind of an event-based system internally where it can be emitted normally as log events, but we also have the means to essentially send them through something like like a vector pipeline where we can do aggregations um, and kind of filter and sample uh, and do that kind of stuff to get better insight into to what's happening in the process. So we haven't gotten as far as I'd like down that road um, at this point, but I think we have a pretty solid foundation to do some some interesting things. Um, and, and it's going to be definitely a, a point of focus in the next you know few weeks. So in terms of the overall roadmap, you've got a fairly detailed set of features and capabilities that you're looking to implement. And I'm wondering what your decision process was in terms of the priority ordering of those features and how you identified what the necessary set was for a 1.0 release. So initially when we planned out the project, you know, our, our roadmap was largely influenced by our past experiences. You know, uh, not only supporting Timber customers, but running our own observability tools. Um, and just based on the previous questions you asked, um, it was obvious to us that we would need to support those different type of deployment models. And so a lot of um, so part of the roadmap was dictated by that. So you can see like um, later in the roadmap, we want to support stream processors um, so we can enable that sort of deployment topology. Um, and um, yeah, it was kind of, it's, it's very much evolving though, as we learn and kind of collect data from customers and their use cases. Uh, we're actually are going to make some changes to it. Um, but and in terms of a 1.0 release, like everything that you see in the roadmap on GitHub, which are represented as milestones, we think that sort of represents, like a 1.0 release for us represents um, something a, a reasonably sized company could deploy and rely on Vector. Um, and so, you know, again, given our experience, a lot of that is dependent on Kafka um, or some sort of some sort of more complex topology as it relates to collecting your data and routing it downstream. And then in terms of the current state of the system, how would you characterize the overall production readiness of it and whatever and any features that are currently missing that you think would be necessary for a medium to large scale company to be able to adopt it readily? Yeah, so uh, in terms of like a 1.0 release where we would, we would recommend it to for like very stringent production use cases. I think what Luke just talked about, internal metrics, I think it's really important that we improve Vector's own internal observability and provide operators the tools necessary to monitor performance, set up alarms, and make sure um, that they have confidence in Vector. Internally, the stress testing is also something that would raise our confidence in that. We have a lot of interesting stress testing use cases that we want to run Vector through, and I think that'll expose some problems, but I think getting that done would definitely raise our confidence. And then I think there's just some like general house cleanup that I, I think would be helpful um, for 1.0 release. Like, you know, the, the initial stages of this project have been uh, inherently a little more messy because we are building out the foundation and, and moving pretty quickly with our integrations. Uh, I would like to see that settle down more when we get to 1.0 so that we have smaller incremental releases and we take breaking changes incredibly seriously. Vector's reliability and sort of least surprise philosophy definitely plays into like how we're releasing the software and making sure that we aren't releasing a minor update that actually has breaking changes in it, for example. So I would say those are the main things missing um, before we can officially call it 1.0. Outside of that, the one other thing that we want to do is provide more education on some high-level use cases around Vector. I think right now it's like the documentation is is very good in that it like dives deep into all the different components, like sources, syncs, and transforms, and all the options available. But I think we're lacking in 
more guidance around like how you would deploy vector in an AWS environment or a GCP environment. And uh, that's that's definitely not needed for 1.0, but I think it is one of the big missing pieces that will make vector more of a joy to use. In terms of the integrations, what are some of the ways that people can add new capabilities to the system? Does it require being compiled into the static binary or are there uh, other integration points where somebody can add a plugin? And then also in terms of just use of the system, I'm curious what options there are as far as being able to test out a configuration to make sure that the end-to-end flow is what you're expecting. So in terms of plugins basically that's there we don't have a strong concept of that right now um, all of the transforms that i've mentioned sources and syncs are all written in rust and, and kind of natively compiled into the system that has a lot of benefits obviously in terms of performance and, and we get to make sure that everything fits in perfectly ahead of time um, but obviously it's it's not quite as extensible as we'd like at that point. So there there are a number of strategies that we've we've thought about for allowing um, kind of more user provided plugins. Um, I know I know that's a big feature of uh, Fluent D that people get a lot of use out of. So it is something that we'd like to support, but we want to be careful how we do it because you know, we don't want to give up our core strengths necessarily, which I'd say, you know, the kind of the, the performance and, and robustness, reliability of the system. We want to be careful how we expose those extension points to kind of make sure that the system as a whole maintains those properties that, that we find most valuable. So Yeah, and that's to echo Luke on that, like we've seen, you know, plug-in, plug-in ecosystems are incredibly valuable, but they can be very dangerous. Like they can ruin a project's reputation as it relates to reliability and performance. And we've seen that firsthand with a lot of the different interesting Fluent D setups that we've seen with our customers. They'll use off-the-shelf plugins that aren't necessarily written properly or maintained actively. And it just implements, it, it adds this variable to just the discussion of running Vector that makes it very hard to ensure that it's meeting the reliability and performance standards that, that we want it to meet. And so I would say that if we do introduce a plugin system, there will be, uh, it'll be quite a bit different than I think what people are expecting. Uh, that's something that we're we're taking, we're putting a lot of thought into. And, uh, you know, to go back to some of the things you said before, it's like we've had community contributions and they're very high quality, but those still go through a code review process that exposes quite a bit of, quite a bit of like fundamental differences and, and, and uh, issues in the code that would have otherwise not been caught. And so it's, it's an interesting kind of like conundrum to be in. It's, it's like, I, on the one hand, we like that process because it ensures quality. On the other, it, it is a blocker in, in certain use cases. Yeah, I think our, our strategy there so far has basically been to allow programmability in limited places. For example, the Lua transform and the, the kind of upcoming JavaScript transform. There is kind of a surprising amount that you can do even when you're limited to that to that context of a, of a single transformation. We are interested in kind of extending that to say, you know, is it, would it make sense to have a, a sync or a source that you could write a lot of the logic in, in something like Lua or JavaScript or, you know, a language compiled to WebAssembly. And then we provide almost like a standard library of, you know, IO functions and things like that, that would, we would have more control over and, and could do a little bit more to ensure, like Ben said, the, the performance and reliability um, of the system. And then kind of the final thing is we, we really want Vector to be as, as easy to contribute to as possible. Uh, ben mentioned some, you know, housekeeping things that we want to want to do before we really consider it 1.0. And I think a lot of that is around um, extracting common patterns for things like sources, things and transforms into kind of our, our internal library so that if you want to come in and contribute support to Vector for a new downstream database or, or metric service or something like that. We want that process to be as simple as possible, and we want you to kind of be guided into the right path in terms of you know handling your errors and doing retries by default and and all all of that stuff we want it to be right there and and very easy so that we can minimize there's always going to be a barrier if you say you have to write a pull request to to get support for something as opposed to to just writing a plugin but we want to minimize that as much as we possibly can 
And there are a whole bunch of other aspects of this project that we haven't touched on yet that I have gone through in the documentation that I think is interesting. But I'm wondering if there is anything in particular that either of you would like to discuss further before we start to close out the show. And in terms of like the actual technical implementation of Vector, I think one of the unique things that is worth mentioning is one of you know Vector's intent to be the single data collector um, across all of your different types of data. So we think that's a big gap in the industry right now is that you need different tools for metrics and logs and exceptions and traces. And so we think we can really simplify that. And that's one of the things that we didn't touch on very well in this in this podcast, but right now we support logs and metrics and we're considering expanding support for different types of observability data so that you can claim full ownership and control of collection of that data and routing of it. Yeah, I mean I could there are, you know, small little technical things within Vector that I that I think are neat to talk about for a little while. But I mean for me the most interesting part of the project is kind of viewing it through the lens of being a kind of a platform that you program, um, that, that it's, you know, as flexible and programmable, I guess, as, as possible, kind of in the, in the vein of, you know, those bash one-liners that I talked about. That's something that it, you know, that can be a lot of fun, can be very productive. And the challenge of kind of lifting that thing that you do in the small on your own computer or on a, on a single server or something like that up to a distributed context. I find it, you know, a really interesting challenge and there's a lot of of fun little pieces that you get to put together as you try to try to move in that direction. Well, I'm definitely going to be keeping an eye on this project and for anybody who wants to follow along with you or get in touch with either of you and keep track of the work that you're doing, I'll have you each add your preferred contact information to the show notes. And as a final question, I would just like to get your perspective on what you see as being the biggest gap in the tooling or technology that's available for data management today. For me, I think there's there's so many interesting stream processing systems, databases, tools and things like that, but there hasn't been quite as much attention paid to the glue like how, how do you get your data in how do you integrate these things together and that ends up being like a big barrier for getting people to get into these tools and get a lot of value out of them there's just there's a really high activation energy um, or it's kind of assumed that you're already bought into a given ecosystem or something like that that i mean that's the biggest thing for me is that it a lot of for a lot of people and a lot of companies it takes a lot of engineering effort to get to the point where you can do interesting things with these tools and like as an extension of that like that doesn't go just from the collection side it goes all the way to the analysis side as well and um we think that if if you know our ethos of timber is to help empower users to accomplish that and take ownership of their data and their observability strategy. And so like Vector is the first project uh, that we're kind of launching in that initiative, but we think it goes all the way across. And so that, that like to echo Luke, that is the biggest thing because so many people get so get frustrated with it where they just throw their hands up and kind of like hand their money over to a vendor, which is, which is fine in a lot of use cases, but it's not empowering and there's a, you know, there's no like silver bullet, like there's no one storage or one vendor that is going to do everything amazing. And so at the end of the day, it's like being able to take advantage of all the different technology and tools and combine them into like a cohesive observability strategy in a way that is flexible and lets you evolve at the times is like the holy grail. And that's what we want to enable. Um, and we think, you know, that process is needs quite a bit of improvement. I appreciate the both of you taking your time today to join me and discuss the work that you're doing on Vector and at Timber. Uh, it's definitely a very interesting project and one that I hope to be able to make use of soon to uh, facilitate some of my overall data collection efforts. Uh, so I appreciate all of your time and effort on that, and I hope you each enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Yeah, and and just to kind of add to that, if, if anyone listening like wants to get involved, ask questions, we have... A, um, there's a link, a community link on the repo itself. You can chat with us. Uh, we want to be really transparent and open, and we're always welcoming uh, conversations around things we're doing. Yeah, definitely. Just want to emphasize everything Ben said, and, and thanks so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening. 
Don't forget to check out our other show, podcast.init at pythonpodcast.com to learn about the Python language, its community, and the innovative ways it is being used. And visit the site at dataengineeringpodcast.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the mailing list, and read the show notes. If you've learned something or tried out a project from the show, then tell us about it. Email hosts at dataengineeringpodcast.com with your story. And to help other people find the show, please leave a review on iTunes and tell your friends and coworkers. workers